but you can put it on your CV forever. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, thanks for sticking around. Um, I'm super excited to talk about this reintroduction um, project that we did last year um, in collaboration with our Tidewater Gobi kind of working group. We have the, the Tidewater Gobi split up into six recovery units throughout the state, and so this is just for the LA Ventura County one, which is the most threatened um, for the Northern Tidewater Gobi. So it's a collaboration with our RCD Santa Monica Mountains, um, Cal State Parks, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, UCLA, and CI. And what was really exciting for me was I got to bring four of our um, CI students in for their senior capstone. So they actually did a lot of the work to put us over the hump. This was like a seven-year endeavor, and so there was all these like little projects that Fish and Wildlife wanted us to focus on um, that we didn't really have the time and resources to do, and so they kind of did a lot of this, this work. Um, last year, and um, it was super successful. So, if you don't know um, much about the Tidewater Gobi, it's a super small um, annual species. Um, they're found, they're endemic to California, um, found all the way from San Diego to the Oregon border. Um, they're found in um, brackish habitats, um, these seasonally closed kind of barbell estuaries, just to give you a sense of scale. This is the largest Gobi on record. Um, <laughs> I collected this back in like 2014 in a site not too far from here, near San Simeon. So this is a beautiful gravid female. She probably has like a thousand plus eggs in her belly, um, but that's as big as they get. Um, they're extremely important to their ecosystem, so they're one of the few fish that are specially adapted for these seasonally closed lagoons. Um, so this is Malibu Lagoon. Um, when I say seasonally closed, that means kind of the, the, the sandbar closes parts of the year, and in many of these systems, they'll be closed for you know five, six, seven years, depending on size and drought conditions. And so this fish is a super like extremophile fish. It's really fascinating. I've collected them in freshwater habitats. I've collected them in um, hypersaline 70 parts per thousand in like agricultural ponds. Um, they don't need any dissolved oxygen in the water. They can suck <laughs> air from uh, the surface, which is, which is amazing. Um, so we find them in Malibu, at least we used to. Um, just to give you um, a, a kind of a glimpse of how this uh, fish is managed, these are the six recovery units. When it was listed as endangered in 94, it was recognized as one species. We now recognize a, a second species that we described back in 2016, which is the, the south coast, um, the southern tidewater goby. It's got a super unique metapopulation dynamic. So most metapopulations, they're kind of like patches, right? So you have like vernal pools, or you have like frog ponds, or like uh, vegetation patches for like butterflies. This is one of the few that's very linear. So it really does depend on the site that's like closest to the north or south of it for it to disperse. Um, the south coast one is split at Palos Verdes. So this fish um, disperses as an adult. Um, and so when these systems breach, it's kind of like pulling the, the plug from the bathtub and it just drains out into the ocean. So the, the, the larvae can't really handle the marine environment. They, they like it more freshwater or brackish. Um, so the adults get pushed out and they can cruise around these sandy bottom substrates um, upwards of 15 kilometers. So they can move a lot, but they don't work well with rocky headlands, right? That's where there's a lot more predators and they don't camouflage as well. So that, that break at Palos Verdes is what split the, the northern and the southern Gobi for probably about over 100,000 years, um, is what our estimates are. Um, we're just going to focus today on the LA Ventura County units. So this is the, the southernmost uh, recovery unit for the northern Tidewater Gobi. This is the most critically threatened, um, mostly because of loss of habitat. Um, and a lot of non-natives, if you can see right here, it's actually hard to see here, but this is the Tidewater Gobi in the, the claw of the, the crayfish. Um, these sites, this was when it was listed, or when the recovery plan came out in 2005, we thought it was one metapopulation for all LA Ventura. Now we recognize it through genomics that it's two metapopulations, and again, it's that rocky headland, so it'd be point doom that separates them. And so the, the southern metapopulation is really just Malibu Lagoon and Topanga Canyon. It's a really small metapopulation, and so both sites are, it's really important to maintain, um, you know, stable, healthy populations in both for it to 
um, function properly. Um, what's good about Malibu and Topanga is they are very close to one another, so it's nine kilometers distance. Um, but they're two very different habitats. Malibu is much larger, it's about 10 hectares, um, and it's got all these kind of little mini micro habitats within it. So there's a lot of fish diversity, a lot of native and non-native predators. Um, it's great for birds, birding if you go there, so all these birds are chowing down on tidewater gobies too. This site gets some upstream um, um, water that, that gets flushed in every single year through the Hyperion treatment uh, water discharge. So this system is open for about three months at least every year. So Tidewater gobies don't really handle that type of um, kind of habitat well. They like it closed. They like it um, more brackish. Um, but they used to be here quite a lot up until the late 80s and then they were extirpated. So Cam Swift, who is now retired, took a, a bucket and he collected 52 of them from the Ventura River in 1991. Uh, this was before they were listed and you could just go and get gobies and just move them around <laughs> wherever you wanted to. Um, and he chucked them in Malibu in 91 and that population went from 52 upwards of over a million was, was estimated throughout the 90s um, and the early 2000s. When you find tidewater gobies in a habitat, they're usually the most abundant fish there. Um, and so that's what founded Topanga Canyon. Topanga Canyon would, had never had any documentation for gobies until 2001. And it was because there was a breaching event for Malibu, and there's so many gobies in Malibu, that they, they got flushed into Topanga. This site is the smallest site that we have for LA Ventura County Unit. It's the most abundant now. It's the healthiest because there's not a lot of predators in there a lot of non-natives. So they just cruise around. It, it, it was um, closed for almost seven years because of the drought. It just opened because of all the, the rains that we got. But you can just walk through here and you can just look down and there's just Tidewater Gobies. It's like Tidewater Gobi heaven. Um, so we wanted to reintroduce them to Malibu because leading up to the Malibu Lagoon restoration, which was in 2012, they had a drastic decline. They collected eight Tidewater gobies in 2012, right before the, the restoration. And after all the dredging and, and all the, the work that they did on Malibu, um, we haven't seen them there since. Um, and so we had to go through and, and try, try to come up with a plan to move some of these from Topanga, because these were founded by Malibu, so it's got the same genetics. Um, and so this is what our students did. They went through each, this is Topanga Canyon watershed. This is all the critical habitat um, that is listed under the Endangered Species Act. And so they spent most of their time in the lower lagoon. They did water quality, they did sediment assessments because tidewater gobies need a certain type of sediment grain size to make their burrows. Um, they also have a very specific diet. They love ostracods and crophium, which I'll show you in a second. Um, but we also have found that they, they love this, uh, it's called widging grass or rupia. So it's, it's designated as critical habitat for them too. So they went through and they, they assessed uh, these sites. They also took um, a few tidewater gobies and we cut them up and looked at what was in their guts to see actually what they were feeding on. And then we went to Malibu and did the same thing. Malibu is really large. So within this entire uh, uh, lower lagoon, there's probably like six different kind of microhabitats. Um, and so they went through and basically wanted to see what kind of, of uh, diet was available, where, where uh, and how dense was the rupia, um, water quality parameters. You can go from the, the mouth of the lagoon, which is very saline, and then on the other side of the bridge is almost fresh, right? So there's a lot of different types of microhabitats. Um, and so they spent a lot of time out in the field conducting this, this research. Found lots of non-native non and native predators. Um, that's the long john mudsucker, which is native. They love eating tidewater gobies. Um, so we don't want to reintroduce them to a site that has tons of mudsuckers, right? Um, but they also love this widgeon grass, because widgeon grass on the sediment has tons of ostracods at the base, but then you have all this corophium that's like swimming around too. So it's, it's ideal habitat. This is what, if you're going out to a site and it's like super dense rubia, that's what it looks like. So there's tons of hiding spots for it. It's actually much cooler because these systems can bake in the summer. So it's really awesome habitat. So they went through and figured out, I'll go back to this, figured out which sites were best. And it was really this, 
um, sites 25 to 28. It was loaded with rupia, it was loaded with ostracods, and they had no um, predators. It was quite amazing. Whereas if you went to the, the lower part of the lagoon, there's tons of mudsuckers, not a lot of, of rupia, it was very like silty, um, so they couldn't really make their burrows. So we were lucky to find three or four locations where they could introduce them. Um, and we went and planned, this is kind of, it's, it's funny because it's, it's such an easy process once you, once, once you can like get the clearance. The, the biggest part is the paperwork and the permitting. <laughs> um, but this took us about four hours to do. We went to Topanga Canyon. This is a super small saying that. We pulled about three times and we collected about 3,000 Tidewater Gobies. So we were able to go through and kind of sift through and pick, select the best ones. Remember, they only live for a year, so we tried to target that like four to six months range. So they were adults, they could get established, but they still had like a good six months that they could, you know, kind of figure out what to do in Malibu, um, where to go, start building their, their nests and things like that. Um, but then we just load them up and it's like three different um, ice chests. They don't even need air. Again, like they're <laughs> the easiest things to work with. You can imagine if you're working with like a more sensitive species like delta smelt or some simonids or things like that, it takes a lot more effort and a lot, a lot more gear and supplies to transport them or like a large mammal, birds, things like that. This two people can do really easily um, and pretty successfully. So we just took them to these sites. You can see the rupia patches on the bottom, which is really awesome. Um, and we uh, released them. It was super exciting. It was really great having the students there doing kind of active conservation. Um, but what we're trying to do is this is, we're, we're trying to build a template so we can share that with all the other recovery um, uh, units because this is listed in the recovery plan as a management tactic, but nobody does it. Because it takes a lot of paperwork, because there's a lot of permitting. We were lucky enough because both sites were within state park jurisdiction, so it, it, it kind of simplified things. You can imagine if we're gonna go to like Camp Pendleton and take some from DOD land to like a national park or like state parks or something like that, it's a little bit, um, more time consuming, but hopefully we have the recipe now and we can build this into our management plans because that's really the road to recovery. We've done a lot of the modeling. We know where they are. Um, a lot of this it has to do with restoration efforts, which can be time consuming as well. Um, so the best thing for us that we've, we've been building into our models is actually doing this dispersal mechanism for them, right? Going and collecting gobies, putting them in sites, um, and being part of that kind of active conservation work. So with that, we come close to time. Let's see if this plays. There's a bunch of little gobies going to the new home. Yay! Yay! Um, any questions?